Hello, I'm Amy Berry, the Library Coordinator at Highland Park United Methodist Church. On behalf of the Church and the Rajabian Summer Series Committee, thank you for joining us for this special program. I know things are a lot different this year, and you're probably missing those delicious Rajabian dinners that have always accompanied our programs in the past. I know I'm missing that amazing fried chicken we usually have about this time in the series. But we hope the advantage of not having to drive and find parking, and maybe even being able to watch this on your own comfy sofa, will make up for that. We're just so glad you're here, and we hope you enjoy each one of the video presentations this summer. Now, it is my privilege to introduce this evening's presenter, Nancy Ashley. An advocate and motivator of lifelong learning, Nancy Ashley reviews great books. Not only does she review great books, she brings those books to life for us in a way that captivates and inspires. In this program, Nancy brings us a book that's been called The Downton Abbey of the American West, A Kingdom of Their Own, The Story of the Palmers of Glen Airy. This story features a strong central character, founder of Colorado Springs, General William J. Palmer, who is surrounded by a strong wife named Queen and their daughters. No doubt Nancy's own experiences raising two daughters and nurturing five grandchildren, as well as teaching high school English, equip her with a depth of wisdom and insight that will help her unpack the riches of this story. A graduate of Mississippi University for Women and Vanderbilt University where she earned her master's degree, Nancy is also a member of the Dallas Woman's Club, Colonial Dames, the Shakespeare Club, and Highland Park Presbyterian Church. With all that going on, we're so glad that she has also made the time over the years to present regularly at the Rajabian Summer Series. We are thrilled that she's back this year. So settle in, get nice and comfy, because you are in for a treat. Welcome, Nancy Ashley. This is a 19th century story that I call Railroads, Romance, and Reality. It's a story of William Jackson Palmer and the woman he fell in love with and married and supported for their entire 24-year marriage. It's a bittersweet story of triumph and tragedy. So I was looking for a subject for this year's program and I went to a local bookstore and found this book, Sergeant's Women by Donna Lucy. And it's the story behind four portraits by John Singer Sargent, the 19th century portraitist. And this 17-year-old uh, Elsie Palmer was living with her mother and two sisters in an old medieval manor house in England in the 1880s. And I said, why is a mo an American mother and three daughters living so well, socializing with all the elites of the aesthetic movement in England, Oscar Wilde, Henry James, and George Meredith, and all these uh, literary greats were being entertained on the weekend at this American hostess house. Where was the husband? Where was the father? What was going on? And so I went and researched more about this Palmer family and found the recent book published in 2016 by Stephen J. May, a Pikes Peak regional historian, and he brought the family of William Jackson Palmer and Queen to life. So my book is A Kingdom of Their Own by Stephen J. May. This story tells the family life of William Jackson Palmer. First of all, who is William Jackson Palmer and who is Queen Mary Lincoln Palmer? And so I'm going to tell you who they are, what they accomplished, and how this all came together. William Jackson Palmer was born into a Quaker family, a very devout family in Delaware. And he grew up on a farm with dogs and cats and lots of freedom and growth. He was taught personal responsibility, all the Quaker values of being kind and being frugal and taking care of others. And so when he was school age, at six years old, they, took, they moved the family to Philadelphia. And he went to a Quaker grammar school and qualified at 12 years old to enter Central High School for boys, which was a very high academic school. Here he learned writing and uh, navigation and surveying and science and math. 
And when he graduated at 16, he was hired by the Hemfeld uh, Railroad to be a surveyor on the west side of the Allegheny Mountains. He goes and works for two years. He had an uncle, Frank Jackson, who worked at the uh, Westmoreland Coal Company, and Frank Jackson was interested in the development of coal-burning railroads. In America, locomotives from 1829 forward burned wood, and this was not sustainable as they wanted to go west. So the uncle sent him on an exploration trip to England for, two, for all the next year, and he wrote articles and sent back to the Miner's Magazine everything that he discovered in the mines and the railroad advancements and the thing in Wales that he saw, a single gauge railroad. And while he was over there, he funded his trip by sending these articles back to the Miner's Magazine, the Miner's Magazine. And while he was there, they were having the 1855 Exposition Universelle in Paris. So he went to Paris to this kind of World's Fair and to the Fontainebleau, and he saw landscaping, irrigation, architect, uh, beautiful things that he is going to use in the future of his life when he builds his uh, castle. So he comes back, and he is hired to be the private secretary of John Edgar Thompson, who is the president of the Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania Railroad, a very um, fine man who mentored him for the next five years. Well, when he turned 25 and he had had this wonderful relationship, How to Run Railroads by Fred Thompson, he was, the Civil War interrupted his railroad, railroad career. He was conflicted as a Quaker and with pacifist teachings to go to war or not, but the Quakers were the leaders of the abolitionists. He saw this as a social issue, and so he recruited his Quaker buddies to be in his Anderson troop. He was going to be the bodyguard for Colonel Anderson, Robert Anderson, at Fort Sumter. So he recruited his buddies. They all agreed they would be temperate, they wouldn't drink, and they were going to be the bodyguards for Robert Anderson. Well, when the Union surrendered to the Confederates at Sumter, this morphed into the 15th Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Volunteer Cavalry, and they are going to be a re reconnaissance troop for the Union generals. The eyes and ears, they're going to go and find out what's going on and help the Union generals succeed. During the time he is leading this volunteer cavalry, he ventures four different times behind Confederate lines as a spy, and the fourth time he gets put in a prisoner of war camp, an old tobacco barn in Richmond, Virginia, for four months. His 1,500 men, Red Cavalry, went into disarray while he was imprisoned. When he got out, he found out that 600 of his men had mutinied at, the, at a battle in Tennessee and were about to be shot or court-martialed, but he pulled the troops back together, got everybody disciplined, and from 1863 around for the rest of the two years of the war, they were in Asheville, North Carolina, Knoxville, Tennessee, Nashville, down to uh, Franklin, Tennessee. And at the end of the war, a young slave boy, about 15, came up to his horse and said, I want to be part of your regiment. And so he got an, the smallest uniform he could get and put George on a horse and taught him how to ride. And all the troops called him Old George because he was so young and he was so little, but he was so dedicated. And he is going to be with William Jackson Palmer for the rest of his life, a very loyal friend. So when the war is over, now his father died in 1863. He had a mother and a sister that are going to depend on him for care the rest of their life. His two brothers were on their own, but he moved his mother and sister to St. Louis where he located after the war, and he got a job as surveyor from Kansas City to California to um, survey where a railroad, what would be the best route for a western railroad to go from Kansas to California. And on this trip, before they left, he met a young doctor from England, Dr. William Abraham Bell, Willie Bell, who had come to study homeopathic medicine in St. Louis. 
But when Willie Bell heard about this surveying expedition going to California, he took a crash course in photography and signed up to be William Jackson Palmer's photography on this trip. They, the expedition hired another photographer, thank goodness, because not one single picture Willie Bell took was able to be used. But he and Jackson bonded as friends and business partners for the next 30 years. They sat around the campfire going west thinking how they could develop a railroad and real estate and luxury hotels and every amenity that went with a steel mill and mining and so many ways they could explore the west and make money. So they came back and Kansas Pacific did not do anything with their plans on how to get to California, but they did hire him as the construction engineer to build a railroad from Denver down to the Pikes Peak region. So he goes down and explores this southern part of Colorado at the Front Range Mountains, and he is taken with the exquisite beauty of Pikes Peak. He said, someday this will be a resort town. This will be the Newport of the Rockies. This will be the Saratoga Springs. In 1870, Saratoga Springs in New York was a wonderful new resort in upstate New York where many people went that had money and enjoyed it so much. So he saw this. He is on a train from St. Louis headed toward Cincinnati to go to Philadelphia to raise funds for what he wanted to build, the, his own railroad. On the train, he meets William Proctor Mellon. William Proctor Mellon was a law partner of Salmon Chase, who Salmon Chase is now in D.C. as the support, Supreme Court Justice. And uh, Mellon wants to invest in the railroads in the westward expansion, so he was very interested when he met Jackson, uh, William Jackson Palmer, on the train, and they were talking business when his 18-year-old daughter, Mary Lincoln, Queen Mellon walked into the car and he was smitten at first sight. There was something about her presence that won his heart immediately. She was five feet tall, had bountiful curly hair, but she was so confident. She had been traveling everywhere railroads went from New York to Philadelphia to Baltimore to Pittsburgh to everywhere. Now he had taken her out west on this adventure and they were headed back toward home. And Palmer now was 32 and she was 18. And he had not had much time to think about women before this, but she was so confident. She had written in her journal, age 15, I think being a wife and a mother is a very high calling, but it is certainly not the only calling. If a man needs someone to sew and nurse and cook, he can hire somebody. I would be willing to be a great companion. And I'm thinking, she doesn't know much about men. But anyway, they fall in love. And this is early in 1869. The next thing he does is after he raises funds for his railroad in Philadelphia, he goes up to Flushing, New York, where she lives, and invites her to accompany him to the inaugural ball of Ulysses S. Grant in D.C. Now this is heady stuff. I don't care how confident and wonderful this young woman's opportunity was. She went to Washington, D.C., met the President of the United States, and it was the greatest uh, congregation of Union generals and officers and buddies and people who had fought together and saved the Union. It was heady stuff to be at that inaugural ball. Well, of course, after that, he took her back home, and he went back to Colorado, which was all pioneer territory, and he had to build a railroad and get things ready because he wanted to marry her. He proposed right away, and they wrote love letters for the whole next year. And she kept calling him General, and finally he said, you can call me Will. And, and he said, don't be afraid to tell me how much you love me because that makes me strong and makes me protected. And so they had a wonderful romance. And in April of the next year, she says to her daddy, we should go out there and see what he's talking about. So they took a train 
and got off at the Kit Carson Depot and had to take a wagon 50 miles to get over to Colorado Springs. There were only about 200 people there at that time and a few shanties and not really much else built, but the vision in his mind was stellar. And he took her to this canyon behind on the north end of the Garden of the Gods and said, I'm gonna call this Queen's Canyon. And inside this 10 mile canyon, we're going to build the house of your dreams. And so she planned and wrote how she wanted the rooms to be hexagonal with the chimney in the center. And so anyway, they dreamed about their house and their future and their children. And that was in April of 1870. He got everything incorporated for his railroad by October, and then November 7th, he's in Flushing, New York at her house, and they get married. They get on an ocean liner the next day to go to England for a three-month honeymoon business trip. Now, Dr. Willie Bell's father is a very uh, aristocratic, uh, wealthy doctor with many wealthy friends in London, England. So Willie Bell goes over there ahead of time, gets them rooms at the Buckingham Palace Hotel. Queen Victoria's flag is flying in the castle, uh, Buckingham Palace across the road. But Queen writes in her journal, this hotel is comfortable but not elegant. And I think that's the way hotels are sometimes when men pick them out according to how much they cost. So anyway, she was not so impressed with the hotel, but Willie Bell's sister, Eddie, was her companion an adventure partner as they explored London while the men raised funds with a lot of different investors. So they met a lot of different people through Willie Bell and his family, a wonderful family. They went sightseeing, went to concerts, did all these different cultural things that you could do in the city of London. And it was near Christmas time. See, they got married November 8th, took the three week or so trip over there and it's Christmas time and she and Eddie go to the east part of London where it's much, much need over there. And they meet a little boy and buy him a new coat and a pair of pants and dress him up for Christmas and they find a little girl and buy her mittens and a, and a bonnet and, and dress her up for Christmas and it made Queen feel generous and good because she loved to do for others. And she loved London even though her life had been so privileged she had, was mindful of the needs of others. So while they were there, Willie Bell introduced them to the Charles Kingsley family, and these people are going to become lifelong friends. Rose Kingsley was 26 and almost a spinster, but very energetic and interesting, and she and Queen hit it off as friends. And her younger brother, 22-year-old Maurice, actually wanted to come to America and go west, and so Palmer hired him to be part of a treasury for his real estate company that um, Palmer's lifelong friend, Dr. Oh, Major Henry McAllister, was running his real estate company and so Maurice got a job working for him. So all this is in the very vestige stages of beginning, but the vision is so clear in Palmer's mind. So after three months in England and much of the time she's in her hotel room writing in her journal knowing that his duty comes before her pleasure and she's, she's trying to get used to that thought because he is 14 years older and he is building an empire and he has been loving railroads since he was born and this is just the mission that he's on and America was expanding west exponentially during these years 1870 to 1873. So when they got back home to America, she stayed in New York and he went back to Colorado Springs to build his railroad because he bought, um, he discovered on his trip in 1855 that in Wales around the mountains they used narrow gauge railroads and the, uh, they were more so, uh, able to go in and around and through mountains. And so he is deciding he's going to build his own narrow gauge railroad that goes around and through the Rocky Mountains and is going to service the mines. There are copper and silver and coal and gold. There are every kind of mine in Colorado and they're in those rock, that front range Rocky Mountains. And so there are two things that he needs to accomplish. He needs to go south to New Mexico to Santa Fe to the, through the Raton Pass or he needs to go through the Royal Gorge 
which is at the Arkansas River on the uh, west side of, so he can go around to Leadville to pick up all the silver and copper and gold and things to take it to market. So he has some railroad wars ahead because the Santa Fe Railroad has deep pockets of support from New York investors and he, um, he gets bullied by the Santa Fe Railroad and they take over the Rattan Pass so he has to get the Royal Gorge which is 1,250 feet of granite and then you go through this canyon that's 10 miles long and there's only room for one railroad on one side of the Arkansas River and so this is a mighty fight and he eventually between 1878 and 80 after they get married this is a railroad war and some of those Western movies we saw as children that had Bat Masterson and Doc Holliday, they were gunslingers for these railroad wars. And we, I didn't know that back then, but anyway. So when she is, stays in New York, while he goes home to build his railroad, he bought steel rails and had them shipped from Wales, and that was a good thing. And he goes back, and in, in um, October, after he leaves her in New York in February in 1870, in October, they're going to come out and he's supposed to have his house built. But in July, he got in touch with her and said, see if your father can go to something like an army surplus store and buy tents because our house is not going to be ready until like the 1st of February and you're going to get out here in October. And October in Colorado Springs is cold. So she shuddered and thought, tents, I should say. But anyway, they they, her father gets the tents and they arrive in October. She cannot believe it. Palmer is not there to greet them. He sends Willie Bell to greet her and her father and her father's wife, Ellen. See, Queen's mother died when she was four, Isabel. Isabel had a younger sister, Ellen, that her father marries. And Ellen is 22 years younger than her father. But by now, she has produced six children for him. So after Queen got married in England and came back home, her father says, you know, since I'm going to be in business with Palmer, I think I will go out there with you and we'll live out there. So they explained to Jackson, William Jackson Palmer, that my father, his, seven ch his wife and six children will be with me. So Palmer was trying to get that 14 room, that first stage of Glen Eyre, he's trying to get it built and finished, but he knew it wasn't gonna be ready by October. When they got to Colorado Springs, he was in the Royal Gorge surveying, trying to be sure he got the passage through there because his entire future of the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad depended on him going through the Royal Gorge. So that was a long fight during the whole decade of the 1870s. So she gets there, Palmer's not there to greet her. On their first anniversary, November 7th of that year, he was not there to celebrate with her, but he finally returned. And they settled in the stable over, in the apartment over the stable, because after one or two nights in the tents they brought, it was freezing. And she was just thinking, this is so uncivilized, I can't do this. So anyway, old George put, set them up in an apartment on the upstairs of the stable. See, everything about the horses were tended to. They had a building for the stables because that was the most important thing to take care of the horses. So she spends a few nights from uh, late October till February the 1st in the stable till they can move in their house. Now Rose, Maurice came over after the He'd been all, almost a year there working in the, uh, as treasury of the real estate company. And Major Henry McAllister was the um, real estate, head of the company, the Colorado company, which was the real estate company. When Rose arrived, she was going to stay for four months to visit her brother and to be there with Queen, as Queen always needed a friend, and Palmer seemed to always have a friend for her. So they are going to have adventures, and Rose kept a detailed journal to tell what it was like those very first weeks of, of Queen being in Colorado Springs. First of all, she started a school. She had six pupils that went up to about 20 pupils. And after a few weeks of teaching school, and then when she couldn't manage the boys who were shooting spitballs at the other girls, she turned the school over to the 
uh, Palmer right away, early on, had hired a newspaper publisher for the Gazette, which is still the newspaper of Colorado Springs. And the editor of the Gazette had a wife who took over as a paid teacher for the school that Queen established. And today, in Colorado Springs, there is the Queen Palmer Elementary School. The second thing she and Rose established was the Grace Episcopal Church. So they had a good place to go to church. And then in January, after she had arrived in October, it was 20 degrees below zero, but she and Maurice and Rose, Maurice could play the guitar, Rose was a wonderful pianist, and, El Elts and Queen had a <clears throat> mezzo-soprano voice, and she had had opera training. She had gone to the Cincinnati School of <clears throat> Art and Music, and so she was a trained musician. So they put on this show for 150 people that came out in this 20 degrees below zero weather, and after all expenses were paid, they raised $60 to start a reading room that was the beginning of the first library for the colony. So she did all those noble efforts those first weeks and months that she was out there. Well, <clears throat> in the early part of the next year, 1872, Palmer still, not only was he building east and west, he wanted to build north and south. He wanted to have a railroad that would go from Cheyenne, Wyoming to Colorado Springs or Denver to El Paso down to Mexico City. But he could not get anybody in American railroads to want to fund a north-south railroad. But he still was exploring. So in early 1872, in January, he invited Rose and Queen to go with him across land to San Francisco on a train and then to go by boat down the coast of Mexico and then across land to Mexico City to talk to uh, President Juarez about building a Mexican railway. Queen didn't feel good. She was nauseated. She was pregnant. And so she made that trip because she didn't want to stay home by herself and she didn't tell him until they were already on the way that she was expecting a baby. But I'm not going to have this baby in Colorado Springs. He said, no problem, after we get out of uh, Mexico City, I will take you to New York to have your baby. So they, they were in Mexico till about March, and then they went to Havana, and they just made a vacation of it up the East Coast. He took her to Richmond, Virginia, where he had been a prisoner of war in an old tobacco barn there, and then he took her to New York, where she stayed until Elsie, her firstborn, was born October 27, 1872. She stays in New York till March of 1873. Now, all the banks in America had been loaning money to build railroads, not only in the West, but in the North and the East and the South. And they started calling in all these loans and started the panic of 1873. This recession didn't really hit Colorado Springs till 1874 and 75 at which time they had to um, move out of Glen Airy, the big castle five or 10 miles from town, and they moved into a rental house on Cascade Avenue. And all the people of Colorado Springs were so impressed that this young, cultured, refined wife of William Jackson Palmer was as gracious in a small rental property as she had been for Christmas parties and all the gala events at their um, larger 14-room house. Now, he built that house, 14 rooms, in 1871. By 1881, he expands it, remodels it till it's 22 rooms. And it's not until 1901, when he sells his railroad for $6 million at the end of his career, that he builds this 67-room stone castle that we know as Glen Airy. Now, while she was in New York having her baby, Elsie, guess what happened back in Colorado Springs? Her 58-year-old father gave his 35-year-old wife, Ellen, another baby. Now he's got three boys and four little girls, seven children. And so when Elsie got back home, she has a friend, and they have babies together. And, they, and Palmer and uh, William Proctor Mellon, the f husband, were off on a business trip for six weeks. They were riding horses. When they went away from home, they stayed for a long time. So Elsie and her mother-in-law's aunt, Ellen, with their new baby, Maud, 
they were there bathing their babies and taking care and they looked up and there were Ute Indians peering in the windows. A mother and a husband and a little papoose. So they invited them to come in. Unbeknownst to uh, Queen, the Ute Indians had been camping in this canyon for eons, for decades. And this year they come and there's a house in there and white people living there. What is going on? So Queen invited them in. Now the only men at home at this time was old George taking care of the horses and two Mexican men who were in charge of the kitchen cooking and so on. And these Indians were invited in and the, wife, the mother could speak English because the missionaries had taught her to speak English. So they, she said, would you bathe our baby like you bathe your baby? And so, yes, well, and so they bathed the little Indian baby and dressed it all in white bunting and made it so precious. And the mother could speak English because the missionaries had taught them to speak English. And she said, this is the happiest day of my life. Thank you so much. And after that visit with the couple and the little papoose, all the other Ute Indians started walking through the house and coming in and seeing all this wonder of civilization. And when Palmer and Mellon got back in a few days, he called the territorial governor of Colorado. See, this is 1873, and Colorado does not become a state until 1876. So they explained to the peace-loving Ute Indians that this was now private property and they could not come in and just make themselves at home. And they peacefully moved outside the canyon to the Garden of the Gods until the season was over because their habit was to follow the buffalo all over the plains. So the, in 1874, William Proctor Mellon, age 59, died and left his seven children and wife in the care of William Jackson Palmer. And I wondered why. Palmer and Queen had this precious little Elsie in 1872, and they did not have another child for eight years, but they had eight children in their house, and this is a deterrent to childbearing, I think. So anyway, we have this situation, and Palmer is taking on, he promised uh, Mellon that he would educate and take care of his children. He leaves them all trust funds when he die, they die. He sends them to he sends the three boys to Oxford University in England to be educated. He now is taking care of his mother and his sister who live in Denver and his father-in-law and the father-in-law left this, this, this large family for him to take care of and educate. But in 1880, after the railroad wars of 1878 to 1880, when the Supreme Court ruled that the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad indeed had passage through the, the Royal Gorge, and his railroad becomes very profitable, taking supplies to all the mines and bringing all their resources to market, he is beginning to make a lot of money in railroads. And so <clears throat> she gets pregnant with her second child in 1870, 1879, and is going to have this baby in 1880 when her friend Alma Streddle, who was one of her best friends from all their visits to England, Alma Streddle is a literary translator of all the European poetry, art, uh, poetry and literature, short stories, everything into English. So during this aesthetic movement when they had wonderful parties at um, at, at the house in England when Queen is going to live over there. She had become friends with this translator and Alma Streddle was married to a guy 16 years younger who was a landscape artist but not as good as John Singer Sargent. Well what happened is Queen and Alma, Alma had a brother who had tuberculosis so she brought him to Colorado Springs for a health cure and Queen invited them to stay at their um, stay at Glen Airy. And so she said, let's go on the train up to Leadville because between, by 1880, there were 150 opera houses in Colorado. They had so much money with all these mines. I said, this is like going to the Dallas Summer Musicals in Leadville. And they weren't elaborate opera houses, but traveling entertainment from New York came through there on a regular basis. So she and Alma get on the train, go to Leadville, 10,000 feet altitude, 
They enjoyed the opera, and when pregnant Queen got back on the train, she had a heart attack, and they were scared for her life. And the little baby, uh, Dorothy, her second baby, was born uh, a few weeks later, healthy and everything's okay. Well, Palmer was so relieved to have the railroad wars ended that within 12 months, Queen had a second baby girl, and this time he was on a business trip. Queen was with him, and they were at the seaside in the south of England when she had baby Marjorie. Now she is afraid, and she had a second heart attack when Marjorie was born. So she's had two heart attacks. She's aged 30 and 31. She's afraid that she is not going to live to see her babies grow up. Her husband adores her. He says, wherever you need to be, I will take care of you and I will come and visit. we will be together. He will commute to the marriage. So the, these first 10 years of the marriage in Colorado, when he's building his empire, have been difficult for her, but she's been a real trooper. But her mother had died from having um, a faulty heart valve, and now Queen evidently has the same problem in her early 30s. So she goes to Newport, Rhode Island to see how that would be, but she's too, um, not, the life in Newport, Rhode Island was too fancy, too social, too powerful for her. So after that, she came back and he had remodeled the house in 1881 and made it into a 22 room, bigger, um, more palatial place to live. And so she enjoyed that for a year, but the air was so thin, she couldn't breathe. She couldn't live in that altitude of the Front Range Rocky Mountains. So she goes back to New York, and the Dakota, where John Lennon was shot at the front door, was a luxury uh, con um, condominium in 1886. And so she lives there for two years. And she stayed sick the whole winter with respiratory problems. Her children had colds, and so this is not it. And finally, she persuaded her husband, the doctors say that I should live at sea level in the south of England, where she had a lot of high-powered friends. So he says, wherever you need to live, I will take you. So she goes and moves into this medieval, this house was built in 1390, the item moat. It has a moat around it and a walled garden. And she moves in with her three children. And little Elsie is about uh, 12 years, she's about 15 years old then. And from that time on, the mother is leaning on this older daughter, help me, you are going to be the one to take care of the little ones if anything happens to motherling, she called herself. So Elsie is 17, and they've been in uh, England for almost three years. When John Singer Sargent had lost favor with the French Academy when he painted Madame X in a compromising way and they kind of ran him out of Paris and, he, and Henry James was his friend. Henry James was 40 and John Singer Sargent was in his 30s when he came to England because Henry James says you can paint portraits here just like you did in Europe. So he was commissioned by Queen to paint the 17-year-old daughter. And he worked on this painting, The Young Lady in the White Dress, for a year. He had her standing up, he had her sitting down, he had her sideways, and finally he takes her full view and calls it the, lady in the, the Young Lady in the White Dress. And there was something about her that was enigmatic because she had pressure from her mother to be um, one thing, and she had pressure from her father. He wrote her letters constantly, wanting her to get up and ride horses every morning and be sure you walk three times a day, three miles, and he wanted her physically fit and strong. And so she got conflicted messages, but she loved both her mother and her father and wanted to please them. Well, back in Colorado, Major Henry McAllister was the ran his real estate company and befriend, he was a lifelong true friend who included um, Jackson in everything in all their social events. But William Jackson Palmer always hosted Christmas for all the kids of the colony like he did the first year he was there when Queen was there hosting the party. He invited, he established the uh, blind and deaf school. He, in 1874, gave land for Colorado College. He was, uh, philanthropic in more ways than we can imagine. He gave parks and paid for them himself. In 1871, when Chicago burned, he hired 
a landscape architect named John Blair to come to Colorado Springs and he had him there for the next 30 years landscaping, planting trees, transplanting cottonwood trees from the Arkansas River Valley to the, he platted streets in Colorado Springs that were 100 to 140 feet wide avenues because he wanted to prepare the city as a place of parks and uh, an infrastructure where people would want to come, people with money would want to come. When he bought originally 10,000 acres for what would be the town site of Colorado Springs, after 1862, the Homestead Act was selling government land for $1.25 an acre. Well, he negotiated to get it for 80 cents an acre, and then he put his friend uh, Major uh, McAllister in charge of real estate, and he sold it at $100, $100 certificates, $100 a plot. And so he made a lot of money to, that was just one of his many enterprises. Then he, he started a steel mill down in Pueblo to make his own tracks, his own steel rails. And he did all different kinds of enterprising things that created an empire. He even opened an off, a business office in London after his wife moved over there so when he went to England he could still do business and talk to his investors. So when Queen, after three years, the owners of this medieval place that had been, on the weekend she had Shakespearean actors, it was 26 miles south of London where they lived originally and she had all the cultural people of the aesthetic movement come out and enjoy the weekends and they just thought this was great. Some American tycoon is paying for all this and we're his guest and it's so much fun. And then Henry James in a, a letter noted that uh, the general Palmer came over with mud on his boots. He's the railway man from Colorado and they kind of spoofed it. He, he was a rustic but he really wasn't and he had his portrait painted while he was there in uh, in Europe several times, which are in the Pioneer Museum in Colorado Springs today. Well, Queen is not well, and she increasingly um, retreats to her room. In the last year of her life, she doesn't even want her children to see her because she's suffering so much from her heart failure. And in December, December 28th, she was, he, they sent word for Palmer to come over because she was not going to live. And he got there two days after she died, December 28th, uh, 1894. By this time, the girls are 13, 14, and, Queen, and Elsie is 22. And he stays and wraps up business in England uh, until March of 1895. He takes them back. Elsie is thrilled to be home. She remembers the people, the lead, they're a leading family of Colorado Springs and everybody welcomed the girls back home, but the two younger girls didn't even remember Colorado Springs. But 1896, and so the father, General Palmer, is gonna lean very hard on Elsie to train the teenage sisters how to be good hostesses because he is going to be one of the major entertainers during the 1876 20th anniversary celebrating Colorado as a state. Colorado became a state in 1876 and in 1896 in the south of Colorado all the gala events were going to be at Glen Airy. So they were hosting a lot of important people and it was a lot of fun. Well in 1901 he sold his railroad for six million dollars to Jay Gould's son and he took a million dollars and put it in uh, thousands of dollars in each envelope and gifted each employee of the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad and thanked them for being his employees and fellow capitalists and he shared the profits with them all the way. He bought a 680 acre park called Palmer's Park that has the best view of Pikes Peak and he donated that to the city and it has biking trails and hiking trails and only two ways that cars can access it even to this day. And last year it was the uh, number one ranked city park, urban park. It's very much like Central Park is to New York City. It's just a great place for people to enjoy close to town, the out of doors, with a perfect view of Pikes Peak. So in 1903 and 4, he took his girls to Europe for 18 months while he had an architect build the dream house that he and Queen had planned while they were courting. 
And he, he takes them to Greece and Italy and England and Germany and just everywhere. And he sends architectural, architectural artifacts back for the building of his house. They start, quarried the stone for this new 67-room castle uh, from Bear Creek Canyon, the Colorado limestone, and he had them wrap the stones in um, mesh so they would save the lichens and the moss. He wanted this new castle to look old. He found a ceiling, a roof to a monastery in an old church in England and shipped the whole seal the roof back to England to put on his new castle so it would look old. And all kind of woodworks and architectural um, amenities, mantles and fireplaces and all these things for his castle. He told his builders, I want it to last a thousand years. So they came home in 1904 to this gorgeous, enormous, big house. And he, they had company and entertained royally and had picnics and lots of things happening. This is Pikes Peak, the beautiful, beautiful place that has sunshine 284 days a year. It's just, and that's um, Pikes Peak looking through the Garden of the Gods. And that's the Garden of the Gods, those remarkable uh, sandstone towers of nature that look like something fit for the gods. And um, that's the way it looked to him when he envisioned this great Colorado Springs resort town where money would want to come. And this was the first version of, well, this was the 1822, 1882, 1881 version of uh, Glen Airy when he moved it from 14 rooms to 22 rooms. And this is uh, Palmer, the young Palmer in the center with Elsie in her precocious confidence on the right and then that's their three little girls that they had by 1882 and and that's what uh, when they moved to New York and, and later to England. Then the girls as they are grown we see here with um, different pictures of the family. So at the end this is the castle that is finished by 1904 and he entertains royally. He he um, is so excited to have this dream house built. So they enjoy it. In 1906, he turned 70 years old on um, September 16th. His two younger daughters, Dorothy and Marjorie, have a guest and he, they want to go on a ride through the canyon. The canyon where Glen Airy is settled called Queens Canyon is 10 miles long and he owned, owned 4,000 acres there. So they're going to go on a little horseback ride before lunch. When they come back from the ride, he leans and, and he gave his great horse. He had two horses he loved. Senor was his big black stallion during the Civil War, and Diablo was his famous black stallion during his life in Colorado. And so he gave his horse to the guest, and he took schoolboy, a little, a little cow pony, and rode through the canyon for this ride. When he came back, he leaned over to unlatch the gate, and when he leaned down, schoolboy stumbled on a rock and threw him head first into a bed of rock and paralyzed him immediately from his shoulder down. A neighbor came by in an electric car. This is 1906. And Palmer had disdained automobiles because he thought he could go everywhere on a horse. <clears throat> So anyway, they took him back to the house. They called the doctor. The best doctors in town were tuberculosis doctors. So they notified Denver to send a neurologist down there to be sure they were making the right diagnosis. He, his brain did not send any messages to the shoulders down of his body. So he was immediately a paraplegic with a bruised spinal cord. A young doctor had come from England two years before, Dr. Henry Watt, he was 30 years old, and so Palmer in, uh, invited him to come be his resident doctor. Dr. Watt put him on a water bed, and for the next two and a half years, he did not ever have a bed sore. He had, he was, had perfect care at home. And so, uh, 1907, he gets an invitation to come to Washington, to Philadelphia to the uh, 45th reunion of the 15th Pennsylvania Volunteer Cavalry. These old Civil War veterans, there were 1,200 of them, but now there are 280 that can get together for a reunion. 
And Dr. Henry Watt said, you cannot go across country. You cannot travel. Well, Palmer said, we'll just bring them out here. So he sent a train to Philadelphia and got 200 men. And then as the train came across the country, they picked up 80 more veterans. And these old soldiers from 50 to 90 years old, 58 to 90 years old, came to Colorado Springs. And he entertained them royally for over a week. They had a parade, and he was with his white linen suit and his jaunty hat and his three daughters, and these old guys had the best time of their life telling tales. He took them uh, and toured around the area. He had put, a, uh, he put them up in his luxury Antler Hotel or in the dorms at Colorado College. He had bourbon cases brought. He was temperate, but when he built Glenary the Castle, he put a wine cellar in the basement with the best wines from Europe, and he brought in cases of bourbon so the men would be, uh, have their libations. And they had one great, wonderful week in 1907. Well, by 1908, Elsie is now getting to be 34 years old. And nine years before, eight years before in New York, she met a guy named Leo Hamilton Myers, and he's nine years younger than she, but he fell in love with her, and they knew some of the same people. He was from Cambridge, England and was with his mother visiting. But anyway, he kept in touch with her the next many years. And so in 1908, she tells her daddy in January, I want to marry Leo Hamilton Myers. And the father said, okay. So they had a wedding at Glen Airy, and then they went directly back to England to live. And 10 months later in October, she had her first little baby girl and they named her Elsie Queen. The daughter Dorothy, was the prettiest of the three girls. And she told her father she wanted to go back to London to um, nursing school and she wanted to be a social worker in the East End of London. And so she goes back to go to school and do that. And truth be known, remember Leo, um, Her let's see, Her Peter Harrison, the 16 year younger husband of Alma Streddle, Queen's dear old friend who was the translator of ar the arts. Peter Harrison had been wooing these two girls, Elsie and Dorothy, while they were growing up. And when Elsie turned 30, he ditched her for 22-year-old Dorothy. And he and Dorothy and Alma, the wife, traveled together and were great friends. And when Dorothy goes back to London to nursing school, she and Peter start living together in a house. And Alma Streddle, the wife, never divorces him, but lives down the street on the same street. And that's what happens to Dorothy. Well, then Marjorie, the baby daughter, says, Father, there's Captain Wellesley in England, and he wants me to come over there and marry him. And Captain Wellesley was the younger brother of the Duke of Wellington. So the Palmer girls had been moving in pretty high society in England. And so by this time, Dr. Henry Watt said, you can't go to Philadelphia to that uh, veterans reunion, but maybe if we go to London and Paris, we can find a doctor who can uh, cure what ails you, this paralysis. So they get ready, get 26 people together for the wedding party for the doctors and the caregivers and everything. And Dr. Willie Bell, uh, no, Glenn Martin, the uh, driver of his electric car, orders a new Stanley steamer and goes over to England, to Liverpool, to meet them. Halfway across the ocean, Marjorie sits down beside her father and says, I really can't marry Captain Wellesley because I'm in love with Dr. Henry Watt, your resident doctor who's been with us for two years. So he said, oh, well, we're in the middle of the ocean. We can't go home. So they took the 26 people in this entourage and Dr. Henry Watt had the new Stanley steamer and enough rental cars to take these 26 people on a tour around England. They have a wonderful time for a couple of months, and they even go to Paris where he sees doctors, and the doctors in London and Paris say, nothing can be done for your paralysis. So they all come home in uh, 1909 on January, February, and on the ocean liner returning home, he says to the crew, I wanna go to the top of this ocean liner and see the vistas of the ocean and they drop him in a sling. He hits a brass rail, his head, and he is not feeling well. So when he gets home, in March of that year, 1909, 
He went out for a, a ride on, he loved going out, for, get fresh air with his Stanley steamer and went out for a ride on March 10th. March 11th and 12th, he didn't feel good. He died at age 72 before his September birthday in March of 1909. The girls all now are accustomed to living in England. After he dies, Marjorie does marry Dr. Henry Watt and live on Cascade Avenue, but Dr. Henry Watt dies seven years later and then Marjorie moves to England. And the three sisters are all friends and together in England for the rest of their lives. And Glen Airy, until 1953, goes into kind of de decay because nobody can afford to keep it up. The city said they couldn't maintain it. So in 1953, the Navigators Christian Ministry bought it. And it is now a place where you can go to have tea, you can go to conferences, retreats. They have a beautiful camp there. It is open to the public. It is beautiful. And he built it to last a thousand years. And that's the way it is. Thank you. That was wonderful, Nancy. Thank you. And thank you all for attending. We hope you'll join us next time for author Tracy Walder's presentation about her book, The Unexpected Spy. You're going to love hearing from this intriguing former spy.